I grew up in the Philippines, and I'm used to powerful typhoons crossing our country. While my hometown is rarely visited by typhoons due to its geographical location near the equator, due to the Coriolis effect, watching the news about the aftermath of the typhoon was just a mundane scene. But on the 8th of November, 2013, the entire country was reeling from what could have been the strongest typhoon of the century. Super Typhoon Yolanda, international name Haiyan, wreaked unimaginable havoc in the central Philippines, in the Visayas region. Tacloban City, the regional center of Region 8, was the worst hit. The disaster claimed more than 10,000 lives, destroyed millions of dollars worth of crops and properties, and displaced millions of people. The locals are used to typhoons, as the region's located at the eastern seaboard of the country. However, everyone got caught off guard by the storm surge. No one was aware about the imminent danger days before Haiyan struck the region. No one listened nor cared about the impending danger of the storm surge, which was reiterated a number of times by the National Weather Bureau. Thousands of rotting corpses lay along the highway towards the airport, which is located at the peninsula part of the city, sandwiched by two bodies of water. Search and rescue operations were futile as well. The entire city reeked of death and despair. It felt like it was a scene straight out of a high-budget Hollywood disaster movie, only that this one happened in real life. Horrible was an understatement. On March 2nd, 2014, I moved to Tacloban City. It was my first facility assignment after I finished my training as an air traffic controller. First job, first facility assignment. I was feeling excited at that time, and all the terrible things I've read and heard about this city were briefly covered by excitement. The city during that time still had an unstable electricity connection, except for the airport. As day turns to night, the city is plunged into darkness, and it becomes eerily quiet. I stayed on the third floor of the control tower, since the staff house was totally damaged by the storm surge. On the third night, I woke up at exactly three in the morning. As I opened my eyes, I saw a tall, dark figure standing at the foot of my bed. At first, I thought it was our office assistant. We were three in the room at that time. The figure wasn't moving, and I felt like it was staring at me. The room was dimly lit, all thanks to the moon's illumination, but it was clear that day that the figure wasn't our office assistant. I just shrugged it off, thinking that my mind was just playing tricks. The next day, I told my experience to my other roommate, my colleague, and happened to have a strong sixth sense. She nonchalantly said, we're six inside our room. The other three are just lost souls probably typhoon victims, just pray. The hair on my arms just rose. Weeks later, my colleague and I were the only ones inside the room. We were both on our laptops, doing our own business, when suddenly we smelled something. It was a sharp, distinct smell of an orchid. I got anxious and asked my colleague if she smelled something. From her body language, I can sense she was really scared. She leaned on me and whispered, she's in front of you. Don't forget to pray for her eternal repose. I thought she was joking, but I was feeling cold that time. I prayed hard that night. The following day, I asked one of the airport employees if he knew someone to, who loves orchids. We have a former employee who used to plant orchids and other flowers near the control tower. She died during Yolanda. The hauntings continued, but eventually, I got used to it. I occasionally go to the city's cathedral and light a candle for the eternal repose of the lost souls around the airport. Fast forward to 7th of November, 2014. On the eve of the Yolanda slash Haiyan anniversary, I rode a jeepney from downtown to the airport. It was just one ride away, around 30 minutes with traffic. For those who didn't know, a jeepney is an ubiquitous mode of transportation in the Philippines. Passengers would sit in front of each other 
and the Jeep usually has a capacity of 20 passengers, 10 on each side. I was downtown doing some errands. By 6 p.m., it was getting dark and hailed a Jeep that would take me straight to the airport. The airport is the last stop, so basically, most passengers would alight before me. As we neared the airport, we were only four left inside the jeepney. I was seated near the driver, while the other three were seated at the middle part. As we neared the airport, the highway became dark. The streetlights weren't working, and there were only a few people walking along the street. The three other passengers, two adults, male and female, said one male child, probably seven or eight years old, were dressed in an ordinary way. Nothing spectacular, to be honest. I assumed they were local fishermen along the area. Suddenly, the adult male shouted, Lugalang, which means that the driver should stop, since the family would alight the jeep in the next few seconds. I thought the driver didn't hear, maybe, because of the loud roar of the jeep's engine, so I told him to stop. He did, and asked me, You going down, kid? I thought you were going to alight at the airport. I told him that the three passengers will alight here. Not me. What he did next was truly terrifying. He started to speed up. The road was still dark. However, from a distance, I could already see the runway lights. We were near the airport. I could sense something was wrong. The other passengers were nowhere to be found, and I thought they went down when the jeep stopped momentarily minutes ago. The driver didn't utter a word. I began to break into a cold sweat. My heart began to pound. When we finally arrived at the airport, the facade of the terminal was brightly illuminated by LED lights. Finally, I saw his face. He was terrified. I gave him the fare and told me something that I made, made my hair raise. He said, you were completely alone before the dim part of the road. When you told me someone will alight, I sped up. I've heard stories from other drivers, just like this one. Did you see them? I nodded nervously. They might be one of the typhoon victims. Some say they aren't aware they're already dead. Please pray for their eternal repose. As I alighted the Jeep, I noticed that the seat where the other passengers sat a while ago was wet. It didn't rain that time. It seemed that someone spilled a bottle of water or something. And then it dawned on me, they were indeed the lost souls of the area. Remember that the entire city was inundated by a storm surge as tall as a three-story building. Despite having a comfy flight from Manila to Sydney, I still felt tired. After passing through immigration, I immediately went to the arrival hall, loaded my Opal card, and rode a train to my mate's flat to Birdwood. It was raining when I arrived in Sydney. At only 18 degrees, the warm shower and the bed were the only two things that I looked forward to. It was still raining when I woke up. The overcast weather made the day bleak and gloomy. Then, I just remembered the things I watched online a few days ago, and one of them was the ghost tours in Sydney. I asked my mate about it, and the next thing I knew, he already booked us an extreme ghost tour on a weekend after my trip to Melbourne. Sydney was not a glamorous city back in the 19th century. Diseases such as smallpox, Spanish influenza, and bubonic plague were prevalent. To mitigate the spread of these infectious diseases, all ships entering Sydney Harbour must be checked by the doctors. Even if there was only one sick passenger on board, Everyone was required to stay at the quarantine station for 40 days. Those who were sick were brought to the hospital for treatment. At least 16,000 people were brought here from the 1830s to 1984. 570 people died here. Today, Q Station serves as a hotel, a conference center, and a part of Sydney Harbour National Park. Our extreme ghost tour was scheduled at around 9 p.m. To beat the weekend traffic of North Sydney, we left Burwood at around 6pm and drove all the way to Manly. We had our dinner there before heading to Q Station, located east of Manly Beach. We arrived at half past eight, 
way too early for the tour. So we went straight to the front desk and toured around. Some of the original relics, like tombstones, luggage, and clothes, were still there. It felt eerie upon seeing those personal belongings that once belonged to people who got quarantined here more than a hundred years ago. We met up with the group at half past nine. Our guide, Bob, told us that we should not rationalize everything we would encounter during the tour. Jason and I are both air traffic controllers, and in our work, we rationalize everything. This time, we have to leave everything behind and open up our sensors. We were given EMF, electromagnetic field sensors. The instrument detects an anomaly of the surrounding electromagnetic field. Experts believe that ghosts manifest themselves as a form of energy. First stop, the chamber. The tour started inside the chamber. There are two rooms. Both are not that big, with a floor area approximately 50 square meters. We were locked inside for at least five minutes just to observe everything. I didn't feel anything in the first room except that it faintly smelled of hay. I didn't mind it because I thought it used to be a barn. But in the second room, I felt something. The surrounding air felt heavy. I felt an unknown force pressing my cheeks. It was quite difficult to breathe at some point. As we went out, Bob told us that it used to be a gas chamber. About 40 people were locked inside for sanitary reasons. Now, it all made sense as to why it felt heavy inside and why I felt claustrophobic inside the second room. Second stop, the hospital. It was quite a long hike to the quarantine hospital. During the early days, it was harder to get to the hospital. You need to climb the steep walkways. Basically, when you're on top, you're completely isolated. The hospital is located near the cliff overlooking Sydney Harbour. There are several buildings around, including the quarters of the nurses and doctors. Hospitals, no matter how modern their facilities are, can get creepy at night. But this one was way creepier than I thought. We first entered the doctor's quarter. It was dark, but cold inside the room, and there were three bunk beds inside the room. As I sat and leaned on the lower bunk bed while listening to Bob's stories, I felt something was pinching my lower back. I shrieked and Bob caught my attention. I told Bob it was nothing. I lied. We went into the main hospital room. It was quite big, and there were six beds. Feeling brave, I lay down on one bed and tried to make some connections. I don't know how, but I just closed my eyes momentarily. I felt nothing, and honestly, the bed felt soft and comfy. I transferred to an adjacent bed near the wall, and the moment I lay down, It felt weird. It felt like something was pushing me, but not in a forcible manner. The room was connected to another room that had a darker history. Bob told us to open the door and asked if we felt something different. Everyone told him that it was colder in that room, despite the doors and windows being tightly shut. Some of our EMF detectors went crazy. According to Bob, there are four resident ghosts inside this room. Two children who love to play hide and seek inside the cupboard, a woman, and a malevolent spirit of an old man. There were stories circulating around that one group who stayed overnight in the hospital, decided to record themselves singing Twinkle Little Star, and they caught something in the recording. They heard children giggling, a woman saying, wait, wait, with an angry voice of a male shouting, get out. Jace had his EMF detector pointed near the cupboard. It went crazy. So what he did was, he got his phone and started recording himself singing the same song. Actually, we were all at the center of the room, and we didn't hear him singing. After we went out, we played back his recording. Believe it or not, he caught something on the recording. There weren't disembodied voices from the children or from the woman, but in the middle of the singing, Someone was shouting in the background, Fuck you! Your singing stinks, I believe! Shit got real. The third stop, the Gravedigger's House. The Gravedigger's House is one of the most haunted parts of the complex. It's so haunted that Bob won't dig deeper into its bloody history. 
It used to be the house of the grave digger and a doctor. Just a few steps from the house is the third class cabin. During that time, there were reports of missing girls and children. Eyewitness reports claim they saw some kids and girls entering the grave digger's house. More so, the doctor was so attached to the girls, especially the young ones. The house is a bungalow. It has two bedrooms with a small living room, dining room, and the kitchen and bathroom are both located at the back part of the house. Bob left us in the house for at least 10 minutes. The first room to the right used to be the bedroom of the pedophile doctor. As I slowly entered the room, the atmosphere had drastically changed. It felt cold and sad at the same time. I don't know. I can't help what be said in that room. I went out right away because I could no longer take the sadness in this room. The second room was rather weird. I was about to enter, but something felt wrong. It felt like there's a force barring me from entering the room. Some of my groupmates checked their EMF and it went a bit crazy. I guess everyone was not welcome to come inside. The back portion, where the kitchen and the bedroom are located, was the scariest part of the house. It was dark, but that part of the house was fairly illuminated by the moon outside. I stayed there for at least three minutes just to observe. I suddenly felt goosebumps all over my body. As I neared the bathroom, it felt sinister. I didn't go inside because my instincts told me not to go there. I managed to take photos inside the house. My phone didn't catch anything paranormal, but all the photos are creepy as fuck. When everyone's outside, Bob confessed that the bathroom was the most haunted part of the house. Locals claimed that a girl was brutally murdered inside the bathroom. She got strangled by barbed wire. Fourth stop, the morgue. Firstly, I never like going to a morgue, especially if it's dark and abandoned. I was very nervous the moment we entered the morgue. To add the scare factor, a mannequin lying at the center, covered with a white cloth. I know it's staged, but it still crept the hell out of me. While Bob was talking about history, it started to get cold, but weirdly only on my right side. No one was standing to my right. There was nothing but a door leading to the lab laboratory. A cold breeze passed through the door. I wasn't paying attention to Bob's story because I felt someone was standing beside me. I whispered to Jace about it. So he scanned his EMF and suddenly there was a spike of energy. He told me to calm down, but I was this close to breaking down. As minutes went by, I started to feel goosebumps on my right arm and I could feel that someone was actually touching my arm. It was like a gentle caress, but definitely not human. I became uneasy after we left the morgue, and Bob noticed it. He smiled and said, The resident ghost liked you, didn't he? Really, Bob? The fifth stop, the shower block. The shower block is the most haunted place in the whole Q station. During that time, those who were sick must take a shower of carbonic acid, not water, at the shower block. The acid kills fleas and ticks in seconds. Two days later, your skin starts to peel off. It was dark and eerie as we entered the shower block. The stench was still there, and I felt lightheaded. The same feeling when you just got out of a boat ride. Bob told us that there were shadows lurking around the dark corners of the shower block. For 15 minutes, we were instructed to roam around and observe. He told us to go to the corner where we feel most uncomfortable. I had goosebumps as we passed by the center aisle and turned right since we both felt uneasy on this side. As we were walking back to the center aisle, I felt someone was watching us from behind. So instinctively, we turned our heads slowly, and there, we saw a dark figure peering from the corner of the block. I'm pretty much sure that my mind wasn't playing tricks on me. The figure was tall, about seven feet tall, and it was darker than the dark. All of a sudden, the figure came right after us. I don't know what happened next, but Jason and I were back at the main door of the block in a jiffy. Whatever that is, it scared the shit out of me. The tour lasted for three hours. It was already 12.30 a.m. when we went back to the parking lot, safe and sound. I honestly don't know how to feel after the tour. 
I was physically and mentally exhausted. Nonetheless, it was still a great experience. It finally validated that I am sensitive to the paranormal. I do believe in ghosts and I don't easily get scared by them, but my experience at Q Station was overwhelming. A lot can happen in three hours. I've always had some occasional paranormal experiences pop up throughout my life. The only one I remember clearly enough to explain well is after my grandmother had passed away. I would feel her presence, not following me around or anything, but in the hallway of her house when I came to visit my grandpa. I didn't see her, but felt a presence watching me that I just knew was her. It was a little scary to feel that presence, but you could just tell that it wasn't anything dangerous, so to speak. As I said, it's hard to explain for everyone, including non-believers, to understand. This experience was the same case with a pet that was very close to me after their passing. Weirdly comforting, I guess. Anyways, my father and I moved into our current house about five or six years ago. It's the same town I've always been in, but a different side, within ten miles of the last house. When we first came here, there were a few renovations done, but the most major change was tearing a wall down to make two small bedrooms and one master bedroom. About a few weeks after we settled in, I started noticing small things. Sometimes cabinet doors would open in the kitchen, shampoo would fall down in the shower, and I even heard footsteps in the basement through my vent occasionally. In the same way I previously explained with my grandmother, it was as if you could feel a presence. One day, I was walking into my room and as I headed down the hall, I looked over to my father's room and saw for a split second what I can only describe as a soldier in green uniform. Right where the old wall used to meet, standing there almost like an image that was of low opacity or a fog. And I could smell a cologne that was unfamiliar. It scared the shit out of me, I won't lie, but it genuinely didn't feel like a presence I should fear. He was just there. I made a habit to close my eyes or look away whenever I walked by from then on. One day, in a random conversation my mother mentioned how she had seen the soldier standing in my dad's room when she visited before. Considering there was no previous mention from either party, you can imagine my shock. She told me she didn't want to tell me what she experienced because she figured I would be terrified and want to move. After a long conversation, she decided to announce to the spirit that we did not mind him staying here, so long as we didn't see or hear him. Normally, I wouldn't be too keen on that idea considering I'm a believer, and with that comes bad parts of the paranormal world too. You never know what you're welcoming. But with this it was different, and you just knew. It was his home too. He wasn't trying to deliberately scare us, that kind of thing. Nothing. No noises, no sightings, not even anything that could be argued as paranormal after that announcement. My mother did some research on the property because she's a big fan of the local history and was genuinely curious. She found out that where this property stands used to be areas of farmland and there was an apparent fire within the vicinity of my home. I can't certainly say anyone died here, let alone in a fire but there were definitely confirmed families, including soldiers in similar uniforms. We joke once in a while about the soldier when something goes missing, but it's all in good spirits. It's been a few years of nothing happening, and now I've come here out of genuine fear and hope for answers on what's been recently going on. Yes, even with no sightings of the soldier, there was always a feeling of presence where that wall was torn down. Even in the basement under the area, you feel like you're not alone. But now things are different. Weird noises will come about once in a while that are not made by us or our cats. Not a big deal, but the feeling of presence in that room has turned a little more dark. For the record, my dad is not really a major believer, let alone scared of the paranormal. So sleeping in his room is fine in his book. But this presence, it doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel right. It feels like I should be afraid for my life, like I'm in danger. It kind of just shifted to that after years of nothing happening. 
I just pointed it out to me being over dramatic at first and feeding into a small feeling, but it keeps getting worse. I started noticing I would be in the next room over on my phone while my dad watches TV and I would jerk my head over to the bedroom hallway because I saw what looked like someone peeking into the living room. It scared me every time. Now, I'll be in the kitchen and see something peek out of the master bedroom, walk across the hall into the bathroom. Sometimes it's like a flash, other times a full body apparition. But like I said, it's a terrible feeling and a very dark figure. Sometimes it's abnormally large or tall and it's always dark. You can't make out even one feature except for size, and the more occurrences, the worse I feel. Sometimes it doesn't even feel like a presence or a human one at least. I express my feelings about this presence to some people, but I don't know what to do. I brought some sage from a local shop and researched how to cleanse the house, but I'm terrified to do it. I'm afraid of making something mad or doing something wrong. Moving is not an option. We don't really have the expenses to just casually up and switch houses like that. I'd also like to add that I feel like I've always been able to sense a strong presence, but never had a bad one like this within my residency. I've always been able to leave wherever gave me the bad vibes. My father worked hard to buy the 200 acres of land around the four corners of Colorado. It was where he went every summer to hunt while my mother, sister, and I went on a cruise. Until I was around six years old and we moved there from California. The land and house were gorgeous. Waking up to deer drinking from the pond, I was lucky enough to have horses, goats, sheep, ducks, and a lot of cats. 22 to be exact. What more could a little girl from the city wish for? In the city, I shared bunk beds with my sister, but not here. I had my own room, my own bathroom. If you've never been out in the middle of nowhere, it's dark, very dark, which is terrifying. At the coyotes howling and the bobcats screaming, I often ended up in bed with my mom. That did not last long. I needed to be a big girl, my parents said. So I put on my big girl pants. My mom would put anointing oil on my head every night and pray over me. I don't know if that's what triggered Pete. The first night I saw something, it was a light, which is odd. You would have to follow. Very detailed directions to get to our home. And no family ever showed up in the middle of the night. I thought nothing of it and went back to bed. Almost every night from then on, the lights got closer. When I told my parents, I was told it was most likely the moon reflecting off the tractor out in front. Kids, kids have imaginations, imaginary friends, maybe all that normal parent advice you tell your kids. Until that night, the glow was on the porch right outside my window. It was bright, and I could tell that it was getting closer slowly. Then I saw his face. He peered in my window and then moved right in front of it and just stood there. I didn't scream or get out of bed. I just kept eye contact because I felt mesmerized. I don't know for how long we just stared at each other, but I eventually fell asleep. When I woke up the next morning, I told my dad, who'd just got off of work. He asked me to describe the man, so I did as best as I could. About as tall as my dad, 5'8", older with grey hair and very deep blue eyes. I didn't understand until I was older the change in his face was because he went pale. He told me he would talk when I got home from school. And we did. He asked me to describe him again and to try and remember everything I possibly could. And I remembered he was wearing overalls, kind of like the ones my dad's uncle who owned the farm next to us did. He told me everything would be okay to do my homework. So I sat at the dining table and started my homework. It wasn't much later I heard a loud crash outside. When I ran outside to see what it was, my father had a sledgehammer and was tearing down the small shed that was not that far from our house. He told me to go back inside, so I did. Later on, he came into the house with a small envelope. By now, my mom was out of bed and asking what all the fuss was. We all sat down, and my dad opened it. There were two IDs and immigration papers and a map. 
That's when I learned his name. I just knew it was him. I had that gut feeling. Remember how I said my father's uncle lived on the land next to us? Well, he grew up there and was in his late 60s. We paid him a visit and my father showed him what he found. He was very surprised and remembered Pete from when he was a kid and would ride his horse past his property to go to school. According to him, Pete and his wife were from Russia and kept to themselves. There were a ton of rumors about them, but nobody really knew anything. He looked at the map and asked my father if he had looked around the property yet. My dad said no, but now they had a plan to check out the woods in front of our property the next morning. Everyone was excited. There were so many rumors about the strange Russian man that lived in the middle of nowhere back in the day. The next morning, they started digging. I wasn't allowed to help, so I just watched. Finally, after some time, they hit something in the ground. They brought it up and it was a big chest. Now, being a Muppet Treasure Island lover, I was excited. Until they opened it and screamed for me to run. I was confused, but always listened to my father and ran towards the house. I told my mom, who was very worried. We ran into the porch to see my dad and great uncle put the chest in the back of his truck and speed off. Those couple hours were hell for both of us. When my father finally made it home, he told us it was dynamite. They disposed of it, and that's when the evil starts the weird noises. Things moving around. Animals going crazy for no reason. And Pete's face is always coming through the ceiling. And the nightmares, oh my god, they were horrible. Plus all the strange accidents, like the tractor starting on its own and almost running my dad over. My mom was so scared one night, she had a heart attack. I know she was a smoker and that was a factor. But she would never tell me what she saw, even as an adult. We moved back to California not long after that. I've seen him a handful of times since, peering at my window, or just standing in the corner of my room. He's never spoken. I don't know what he wants, but I'm happy I haven't seen him in years. So Pete, if you can read this, I hope you can find peace. I've never really considered myself to be sensitive, although I have seen a person who recently died. Last summer, I was in New Orleans with my husband, and we went on your typical run-of-the-mill ghost tour. The last stop was at the Lallery Mansion. Suddenly, something came over me, and I couldn't face the mansion. And I had this loud voice in my head tell me, we don't acknowledge her. My husband asked me what was wrong, and I told him, we don't acknowledge her. He looked incredibly confused and I apologized and said, I can't look at that place. I'm sorry. The next day, we went to the New Orleans Pharmacy Museum. While inside, my husband was immediately affected with a sharp headache. Meanwhile, I felt like someone was immediately attached to me and he had his hands on my uterus. He was trying to touch my abdomen. I repeatedly heard in my head, let me look, I want to see. When we went upstairs to the top of the museum, my husband's headache became considerably worse. I got the sense that whoever was on me wanted him to leave so it would be just me. After passing a particular exhibit case, my husband announced that we were leaving and to stay where I was and not to come to him. He just kept repeating, I don't want you to see. As soon as we walked out of the front door of the museum, his headache immediately cleared and I could feel the man watching me leave. His frustration was palpable. He wanted to separate us. Later, back in the hotel, I did some research and found out the doctor who used to live there. The bottom was his pharmacy and the top his living quarters. He used to torture pregnant women. He would get them alone or away from a male companion and basically torture them to death. I recently had a baby, and I got this strong feeling that the doctor in the museum had never seen a uterus after childbirth, and he wanted to see. I also read that sometimes men experience strong and excruciating headaches, and don't stay in the museum long, leaving their female companions, wives, girlfriends, whoever, alone.
I used to walk everywhere when I was a teenager. I'm also something of an insomniac. I bounced from house to house in the dead of night with the hope of having one of my friends keep me company. It was about 2 a.m. when a friend of mine finally kicked me out of his house because he just wanted to sleep. I was nearing the halfway mark of my six mile walk home when I turned onto a major street and saw a man in blue jeans and a gray hoodie walking ahead of me. I got into defense mode because it was a ghetto neighborhood and I didn't like the look of anybody besides me walking around at such an hour, especially with their hood up. I thought that I might get jumped. We were coming to a three-way turn and I suspected that he may have had some friends waiting where the dirt road started on the left. I crossed the street to the right, the direction of my house, way early. Right through the middle of the street. When I made it to the other side, underneath a big, bright street light, I turned to smirk at the wannabe gangster. I thought that it was funny that I had enough street smarts to outwit him. He looked right back at me. We looked at each other for what felt like an eternity while walking away from each other. There was something wrong with his face, but I couldn't figure out what it was. All I knew was that it scared the shit out of me. I kept walking calmly and mad dogging him until he finally hit the end of the road on his side. The rock faced side of a mountain. He disappeared into it. I walked the last few miles home fueled by adrenaline. I wasn't just ready for any gangsters or thugs to jump out at me. I wanted it because I was so tough and fearless. Hell yeah. I don't know how long it was that I cried that night when I got home. I cried. I talked tough in a whisper so I didn't wake up my parents and I slowly came to terms with what I saw. It had a human body, teenager clothes, pale skin, and no eyes. There were just two deep, black, endless holes where the eyes should have been. Looking into them was like seeing the visual representation of fear. I tried to sleep that night, but all I could see when I closed my eyes was that face with no eyes. I eventually put it away in my mind. Just a silly ghost story memory. It was just a guy and it was late, and I imagined the no-eyes crap, and he probably didn't disappear into a mountain. I convinced myself of that for two years. Then, my big sister came to visit. She was supposed to come that Sunday, but she showed up very late, around 9pm, and burst through the front door crying. He wasn't right, she screamed. He didn't have eyes. My mother held her. My 19-year-old big sister, crying and wailing like a baby. My father and I listened to her boyfriend's story. We stopped at a red light. This guy was crossing really slowly. He looked like a homeless guy. Blue jeans and a grey hoodie, with his hands in his pockets. Anna was telling me to just go because he was walking too slow. I was about to. It looked at us. It didn't have eyes. It didn't have eyes, Frank. They were like holes. My sister started screaming, and you didn't do anything. You could have driven away or run it over. You just let it look at us. My mother led my hysterical sister out of the room, and I continued to listen to Jacob explain himself to my dad. I just couldn't do anything. I froze. I felt like I tried to hit it. Something bad would happen. My father has no sympathy. He just went on and on about what he would have done. He also said that they both imagined the no eyes part. It was laid to rest for years. I was trying to quit cigarettes at 17. My parents didn't even know that I was a smoker. After weeks of begging my sister, I convinced her to take me to Walgreens for nicotine patches. We went on a day that our parents decided to go out to dinner, and she also happened to be working a second shift. Walgreens was packed at 11 p.m., and we parked in the back near the dumpster. I thought that I had caught a glimpse of it when we were pulling up, so I tried not to look around toward the roof. I failed. I looked. I said nothing for a while. My sister and I were discussing whether I should get nicotine patches or gum when I fell to the floor and started crying. I saw it. I saw that thing with no eyes. It was dressed the same, but it had one arm out. Its right hand wasn't in its pocket. It was out. Its arm was longer than its body. I can feel it looking at me right now. My sister got down to the floor with me. She ignored the security that had surrounded us. Listen, she said. I saw it on the roof. I didn't see the arm thing, 
but I saw the thing with no eyes. I'm ignoring it. Maybe it's watching us, but I'm ignoring it. You need to ignore it. I know you, and you're not a coward. If you can stand up to guys bigger than dad, you can ignore that thing. She took security down and bought me the gun. As we walked back to her car, I could feel it watching. Look at your feet. That's what I'm doing. I'm ignoring it, my sister said. That just told me that she could feel it too. I looked at my feet. I didn't look up at the roof when we got into the car. She took me home. Our parents still weren't there. She ordered us pizza and buffalo wings. We watched Back to the Future. I never saw the thing with no eyes again, but I still think about it. I still can't forget what it looked like. For context, I live in Southeast Asia and this happened many years ago. I was about nine when this happened. This was not my first experience with paranormal stuff, but it was the most unsettling. During my holidays, my parents sent me off to a short camp at an old school that has a dormitory built within its premises. We later found out that the dorm was built near an old cemetery. Everything seemed normal until the evening. I made friends with the other kids there and unfortunately, one of the girls staying at my dorm room, two bunk beds, four kids, had to leave as her grandma was in the hospital. This left the top bunk of my bed empty. I found it hard to sleep, being anxious away from home, and was the last one awake in our room. It must have been around 2 a.m. when I started to feel really uneasy. It felt like the safety got sucked out of the room. I was laying down and facing the wall, so I turned around to see if anyone entered our room. Instead, I saw a pale face hanging down from the top bunk, staring at me. It's hard to remember all the details, but what stuck with me was its huge red mouth. It looked human, except it had an abnormally large blood red mouth and it was smiling. Its eyes were wide with what I perceived as glee. The entity did not come any closer to me, but it stayed hanging over the bunk with that sick smile and started swaying. This made me scared to move past it as I sensed it did not have good intentions. I had my phone with me, so I called my parents to come fetch me, as I didn't want to spend another day there. My phone's dial pad glitched a few times, but eventually, I was able to contact them at around 4am. The camp leader moved me to another room. I had to stay the remaining two nights as it was part of their policy, apparently. The other two nights were peaceful. I spoke to the two people staying in my first room, and they said they slept fine. I've been going to my two friends who happen to be twins house ever since I was good. It's a pretty old two-story house with a basement. Apparently, way back when one of the kids that lived there climbed a power pole and got electrocuted and passed. Now I don't know how true that story actually is, so that little ghost story never scared me. We all used to play this game we called Murderer. It's pretty much hide and seek, but you pretend to murder the hiders when you find them and hiders would scream when caught. I loved playing this game as a kid. At a party, when I was around 14 or 15, we were all playing again for old time's sake. I was the murderer for this specific round, and while I was counting, I distinctly heard someone go downstairs to the basement. I remember thinking it was a rookie move because those stairs creaked loudly, and the spots to hide down there were pretty limited. After I finished counting, I walked downstairs and started to check all the normal spots that people would hide. That's when I noticed something was off. I had chills up and down my spine. It felt cold. I felt like I was being watched. I didn't want to be down there anymore and turned to head back upstairs when the light shut off and I heard the door to the stairs slam shut. I started screaming bloody murder and ran up the stairs and banging on the door as it got locked somehow. I was screaming as I felt something dark and sinister coming up the stairs behind me. I was screaming and crying, begging for someone to unlock the door. I heard a bunch of footsteps rushing down the stairs from the upstairs, and my friend's voices on the other side, telling me to open the door. I was yelling back that someone locked me in, and that I wanted out, and didn't want to play anymore. 
I could feel the presence behind me still, and I've never felt that scared in my life. I thought I was going to get dragged back down the stairs, but whatever was on the stairs behind me, when the door finally burst open, and I ran out of a crying, terrifying mess. I started yelling at my friends about how cruel it was to lock me down there. They all looked at me like I was crazy. They all decided to hide upstairs in the crawl space in the attic, and no one had even been on the first floor or the basements. That alone made me question the footsteps I heard go to the basements, but what they said next made my blood run cold. The basement door locked from the inside. Back in 2006, I stayed the night at my girlfriend's, now wife's house. It was the middle of winter and there was a storm passing through. So my girlfriend and her parents suggested I stay the night. This was a relief since I lived 40 minutes away and the wintry mixes can make the roads quite icy and difficult to drive on. This is middle Tennessee. Her parents' house is your typical 60s ranch style home. It still had the wood panel walls that were common in that era and creaky wooden floors. I stayed in the spare bedroom that was right across from my girlfriend's. I always have a problem sleeping in different beds, even on vacation. But I had spent the night once or twice prior to this and knew what to expect. I kissed my girlfriend goodnight, went into the spare bedroom, and fell asleep. I woke up suddenly, hours later, to the sound of slow, heavy, thudding footsteps in the hallway. At first, I thought it was a dad walking to the bathroom. It wasn't. I heard the steps continue down the hallway before stopping at the door of the spare bedroom. The bedroom is occupied by me. The steps continued into the bedroom. The door did not open. My heart was beating out of my chest. Slowly, the steps made their way to the bed and stopped. Internally, I was in full panic mode, but I was somehow able to remain calm. A few seconds later, I could feel it sit or lean on the bed beside me. I was facing the wall, so I really had no idea what was behind me. I managed to somehow move a little closer to the wall. It too moved closer. I quickly grabbed my cell phone and called my girlfriend. I'd already figured that whatever was behind me wasn't human, so I didn't necessarily feel physically threatened. She answered after a few rings and I asked her to come into the room. Maybe she thought it was a midnight rendezvous. She walks into the room a few seconds later, flips on the light and asks me what's going on. I turn around and there's nothing beside me. It takes me a minute to collect myself. I brush everything off and make up some story and tell her to go back to sleep. I take out my laptop and play some Christian music, hoping that it'll ward off any future guests. The next morning, I told her exactly what happened. She wasn't shocked. She told me stories of how she and her sister would hear typing in the middle of the night in her dad's office when they knew nobody was there. She's heard someone run up the basement steps and slam the door shut, and nobody would be there. Her aunt had a similar experience as mine with the footsteps in the hall. She got up to see if anyone was there, and the hallway was empty. To this day, I'm still a little paranoid when going over to my in-laws, especially when I have to go to the back bedrooms. A few years ago, we were living with them in between selling our house and moving to the next home. One evening, I got up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom, and I'm pretty certain I heard someone whisper outside the bathroom door. I somewhat brushed it off but their memories are still there. Oh, and apparently, their parents have never witnessed anything after living there for almost 30 years. Lucky them. So this is something that did happen directly to me, multiple times. The first time I was trying to sleep and just had a very bad vibes. My room felt cold to be exposed, but hot to be under the covers. You'll probably get what I mean. Anyway, I was quite creeped out and I had no idea why. I tried to watch some YouTube on my phone to get my mind right and felt comfortable enough to fall asleep. I eventually did, but was having hazy and creepy dreams. Can't remember exactly what they were about. This was years ago. I started hearing screaming, so I woke up. I looked at my nightstand and saw the clock. 
It read exactly 3 a.m. The screen was coming from my cell phone. I looked at my cell phone, which was now somehow in my hand. It was playing some demonic YouTube video or theory video. To this day, I still have no idea how I was able to go onto my phone, unlock it, search up demonic videos and hold it to my face at 3 a.m. I have no history of doing things in my sleep other than speaking or thrashing. I was severely creeped out by the incident and for a while chalked it up to something akin to sleepwalking. Deep down, I felt like something was in control of my body though. I could never shake that feeling until this day, years later. It still irks me. My second of many experiences is a bit more straightforward. Another odd and creepy feeling before falling asleep. Once I was asleep, I was dreaming. Only my dream took place in my room at night, and I woke up from my sleep in my dream. I was very creeped out, and everything seemed off. I thought I heard a child or little boy laughing, so I sat up in my bed. I looked to the left, and didn't see the side of my room from where I was in my bed. Normally, there's just a wall there, but when I checked where the noise was coming from, it looked as if there was a small door in my wall. I slowly walked to the door and opened it. It creaked open, and there sat a little boy. Pale skin. Overalls from what looked like the 18th century. Leather shoes and a striped shirt I had never seen anyone like before, and it was a very odd dream. I talked to the boy, and he seemed friendly. He said he was hiding. I asked why, and he didn't reply. I went back to bed in my dream and woke up in real life covered in cold sweats and with my pillows thrown about the room. I looked over at my side table. It was 2.55 a.m. My clock is five minutes behind. So it was actually exactly 3 a.m. in the morning. Creeped me out a lot, but eventually fell back asleep. I woke up the next morning and felt fine. These two instances are two of the more prominent incidences of a 3 a.m. paranormal awakening, I recall, off the top of my head. Once again, mainly chalking it up to an overactive imagination. Or if it does have to do with something paranormal, likely a negative entity leeching off of the negative energies in my household. I think my father may be the reason for that. This isn't something that happened directly to me, but my mother. It's only happened a handful of times, but... I digress. One night, several years ago, my mother was trying to get some sleep in here in my father's bedroom. It was about 12 a.m., a July evening. Most of my family was asleep except for my father and me. I couldn't sleep. My dad would often stay up late on the main floor. We stayed upstairs. The house felt awfully cold and dreary for a summer night. I just tried to sleep. I was woken up by a blood-curdling scream coming from my mom's room. I was scared, but figured my father would handle the situation. He eventually came in and she screamed again out of fear, but my father just told her to shut up and go to bed. The next morning, I asked my mother why she was screaming. She said there was a tall man standing in the doorway, too dark to make out any features. She said it looked like he was wearing a trench coat from the mid-20th century and a large hat similar to a top hat, but with a larger brim. She said he simply stood there with a demonic presence before fading into the darkness. She said she saw this demonic figure two more times. She hasn't seen it since. I was skeptical of my mother's story, but every night she said she saw the figure. I had a creeped out feeling as if someone was watching. I would sometimes think I see figures in the hall, but would often dismiss these figures as my imagination. We're both originally from the pretty far northwest highlands of Scotland, and we were both living there one winter, working the same job. Salmon farming, if you're curious. It gets really dark, really cold, and really stormy in the winter, and we are from a very small village next to the sea, with maybe 50 houses spread out along a few miles. Just darkness, heather moors, sea, and mountains on either side, outside the little row of streetlights. I was living with my mum in her little stone house, which was cosy enough and nothing untoward happened. 
But my brother was renting a massive house about half a mile up the road. It was about six bedrooms, I think. Very old and tucked away in some trees at a bend in the road. Most of the rooms were unused and full of old junk, which was spooky enough. My brother just used his living room, bedroom, and we had converted a downstairs room into a gym that we used together. Apparently, he was sitting watching TV one night alone on a fairly still night. His living room had a direct door to the outside which was seized shut, and the door handle started to rattle. Not the whole door shaking with the wind or whatever, just the door handle, as if someone outside was ragging on the door trying to open it. Even more unsettling is that there were big windows on the house and you could effectively see the outside of this door. Obviously, nothing was there. After a while it stopped, but I think he had a very restless night. He's not really into this kind of thing, so I'm inclined to believe him. He seemed rattled the next day. What's more, I may have imagined it, but when I was working out in our rudimentary gym alone, I had a key, I could swear I heard footsteps or the sound of someone pushing a heavy thing across the floor upstairs. Most likely just the wind, but it did creep me out a little, even in broad daylight. And on top of that, the closest building to his house is actually an 18 or 19th century ruin. There are a lot of these there, just on the other side of the trees. It's set back from the road and upslope. So on a dark night when the street lights don't catch it and it silhouettes quite spookily. So anyway, everyone I know agrees that this ruin is different from the others in the village somehow. There really are loads of them left over from the Highland clearances, a particularly dark time in the Scottish Highlands. I've always felt the need to speed up when I walk past it, and my wife even said the same thing last week when we went for a stroll. There's just something weird about it. When I was living there and had to walk my mum's dog, he used to get his hackles up and growl in its direction most nights. All the other ruins feel just quite benign and empty. You don't really notice them, and they're pretty close to the modern roads, so are well lit by street lamps. Most probably a deer or something like to frequent it, which annoyed the old dog. And the way it looks is quite stark and does set the imagination going. But I can't help thinking that there is some kind of mournful, vengeful presence there that terrorizes anyone living nearby on a cold highland winter night. The first time I experienced anything happen to me back in 2006 when I was 15. I went to the dentist one morning. When I was done, my mom told me he would head back to our house so she could make me something to eat before dropping me off at school. I remember I was sitting at the kitchen table just talking to my mom about how school was going while she was cooking me some food. The kitchen table was right in front of the staircase that led up to the second floor where mine and my brother's rooms were. I was sitting at the side of the table where my back would be facing the staircase. While I'm sitting there, I could feel a breeze on the back of my neck. Then out of nowhere, I could hear someone say, what are you doing, in a creepy voice. As I started to turn around, I could see this black figure running down the stairs towards me. I yell and jump across the kitchen table, knocking everything over. Reminder, this is at around 9.30 a.m. The sun is completely out. Everything was going normal like any other day up until that point. My mom turned around looking at me and asked what just happened. I told her what I had heard and seen. My mom said she didn't hear anyone or see anyone or hear anyone coming down the stairs. We went and looked upstairs and throughout the house, but we didn't find anything. We were the only two there. My dad was at work already. He starts work at 5 a.m. and my brother had left for school at 8.30 a.m. That was the first, but definitely not the last time I would hear footsteps coming up and down the stairs. The second story I have for y'all actually happened to my mom, but it kind of involved me. So this had to happen about five years later, when I was 20. My brother and I both had the night off of work, so we decided to stay home and play some cards with our friends online. It was just like any other night, having, just having a good time playing videos. It was probably around 1am when our mom came upstairs asking us to keep our voices down, and we told her sorry for being so loud. She headed back downstairs. A few minutes later, me and my brother could hear her talking. 
and she was saying my name, but we couldn't make out what she was saying. About two minutes later, she came back up the stairs and asked me what I was saying to her. I had a look of confusion on my face and told her I didn't know what she was talking about. She told both me and my brother that while she was getting a drink of water, she seen me walk down the stairs wearing my hoodie with the hood over my head and said I sat down on the stairs and started talking to her, but she couldn't really understand what I was telling her. Then she said I stood back up and just walked back up the stairs, and that's when she came back up to ask me what I was saying. My brother and I both told her that I didn't go downstairs to talk to her and that I was in my room the whole time. She just looked at us and said, well, something was talking to me down there. That was the last time I remember something creepy happening that involved the staircase. We lived there for another four years without anything like that happening again. Me and my girlfriend moved into the apartment we're currently living in about a year ago to this day. The first four months we were there, we never saw anything strange or creepy going on. I'd say the first time that something happened that got our attention was in October of 2021. When I went to grab some food for us to eat one night and my girlfriend was on the phone face to face with her sister. She told me they were just talking about how their day went. You know, just having a normal conversation. That's when her sister said, Tell Jose I said hi. And she responded, he isn't there. That's when her sister said, then who's standing behind you? Apparently, there was someone standing over her shoulder looking into the phone while they were FaceTiming. Ever since then, my girlfriend has seen things from time to time. Like she'd be in the shower and could swear she saw me walking into our bedroom and start having a conversation with me. But when she'd get out, I wouldn't be there. Or she would hear the front door open and footsteps thinking I'm home, but I wouldn't be there. As for me, I would hear knocks or bangs on the wall, and just recently on two separate occasions, I've seen something creepy. Number one, I was out riding on my motorcycle about two weeks ago, and when I got home, I decided to take a nap on the couch. When I woke up, I was in one of those states where your mind is awake, but your body is still asleep. I'm trying to wake my body up, but that's when I hear footsteps walking towards me, and I can hear someone telling me, hello. I looked over where my motorcycle helmet was, and could see a reflection of a dark figure walking towards me. At that point, I'm freaking out, and I kind of start to sit up. But when I do, I could feel someone's hands start to push my body back down while making a shushing sound. Next thing I know, I bolted up from the couch, and whatever was there was gone. Now, I don't know if I actually saw something or if it was my mind playing tricks on me because of sleep paralysis. And the most recent thing I saw was actually caught on one of my security cameras last week. On the security footage at around 10 p.m., you can see the rug at my front door slide a good foot or two away from the door. And about two seconds later, you see a shirt fall to the side. I've shown the video to a lot of my friends and it freaks them out just to see something like that. Not really even sure what to think of the whole situation. I guess I never really paid attention to what was going on, but now that I have it on video, I can definitely say something strange is going on. I've been gifted ever since I was 12 years old. Crazy stuff happened in the house where I used to live with my mom. Posters ripping in the middle of the night, whispers, hearing someone run up and down the stairs while everyone was sound asleep. I saw a lot of apparitions. I used to be scared when I started seeing them, but got used to it over time. Through the years, I gave friends seances and help with hauntings. It was never anything dangerous or malicious. Fast forward 14 years, I live in my own apartment with my boyfriend. I've lived in this apartment for four years now and nothing remarkable happened besides having a ghost cat for some time, but I think she moved on, as I haven't seen her in months. My boyfriend never seemed to believe or notice the cat ghost. I used to think he was just a skeptic, which is okay. I just like paranormal stuff and spirituality. He doesn't need to. His cousin sadly died two years ago. She was only in her thirties. It was while we were on holidays in Spain visiting his family. 
It was very sudden and unexpected, and we were supposed to meet her next week. That same year during winter, she showed me a vision during my deep meditation, showing a happy memory of them playing on a dirt path. I told my boyfriend that there was supposed to be a picture of it in a photo album his mom had. He got teary-eyed. I think this opened him up a little more. Again, fast forward two years. He knows how much I'm busy with spirituality, giving people readings and such. I have a lot of crystals, cards, etc. I had ordered a book for developing paranormal gifts and tarot cards. These tarot cards were second-hand. I don't mind. But here's where it gets bad. One night, I'm woken up by our lamp next to my bed, being turned on and on, and I see my boyfriend, Antonio, sitting up. I say to him, what are you doing? He asks me if I also heard that weird voice. I say, no, what voice? He says, it's like a mean old woman. It came from the corner of the room. I kind of chuckled, thinking he was dreaming. After a minute of staring at the corner, he laid back down and turned off the lamp. The next day after work, I came home and asked him about it. He still swears up and down he hears a witch-like voice cackling in the room. Since he's a skeptic, I believed him. He would never make that up. I saw the raw fear in his eyes and it was horrifying. I didn't hear a voice as I was sleeping deeply. That day, I cleansed the house as deeply as I could and it never happened again. My thoughts are it could be connected to the cards. Since they were second-hand, it might have had some energy attached to it. Anyway, I got rid of the cards because my instincts told me to do so. The apartment is peaceful now. What does everybody else think?